Hello and welcome to DNA Genotech and Omega Biotech's joint webinar discussing saliva as a diagnostic tool for COVID-19 testing, a comprehensive workflow from collection to detection. Today we will be discussing saliva as a viable alternative sample source to na invasive nasal pharyngeal swabs. I will highlight DNA Genotech solution for saliva collection. My colleague, Dr. Tara Crawford-Parks, will be discussing our R&D efforts, demonstrating the detection and sensitivity of the SARS-CoV-2 virus in saliva. We will then pass the torch over to Dr. Kiran Durbasala from Omega Biotech to discuss their extraction solutions and to present recent study findings verifying the use of saliva collected in DNA Genotech's devices paired with Omega Biotech's viral RNA extraction solution to enable SARS-CoV-2 detection via RT-QPCR. My name is Laura Cunningham. I'm a product manager at DNA Genotech, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. And I'm excited to introduce our two speakers presenting today. Dr. Tara Crawford-Parks is an R&D scientist at DNA Genotech, working on the product development team. Tara joined in 2019 and currently leads multiple projects to support the verification and validation efforts of our molecular product portfolio. Prior to DNA Genotech, Tara received her undergraduate degree in biomedical science with a minor in chemistry and a PhD in cellular and molecular medicine from the University of Ottawa. Dr. Kiran Durvasula is a product manager at Omega Biotech. As product manager, Kiran is leading the efforts to develop and deliver novel nucleic acid extraction products, supporting the fields of basic and translation research, diagnostics, and pharmacogenomics. Dr. Durvasula obtained her PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Florida at Gainesville and received her postdoctoral training at the Georgia Institute of Technology. Welcome ladies and thank you for joining me today. To start us off, I wanted to provide some background information. So DNA Genotech is a biotech company located in Ottawa, Canada, who has pioneered the medical device industry of biospecimen self-collection and stabilization first in the human genomics market, and more recently on the microbiome side. We built a broad portfolio of intellectual property around device design for optimal user experience, as well as reagents for the stabilization of nucleic acids. Worldwide, there are challenges and constraints surrounding COVID-19 testing. There are hour-long waits, which then result in painful and invasive nasopharyngeal swab collection not to mention the safety concern to both the patient and healthcare professional. Saliva sampling offers a lot of advantages to aid in the detection and surveillance of this deadly virus. In terms of non-invasive solutions, we are promoting two saliva-based products for COVID-19 testing, one used in conjunction with a validated diagnostic assay. As you can see on the screen, the Omnigene Oral is a collection device that allows participants to spit one mil of saliva directly into the kit, which then mixes with one mil of stabilizing solution from the flip lid. Our or collect RNA still collects saliva, but does so via a double-ended cap with a sponge that is placed in the cheek pouch where the saliva naturally cools. The lower gum line is swabbed 10 times each side and then placed in the stabilization solution. Both these devices are safe to use at home and proven to stabilize viral RNA at room temperature and during expected transport conditions. These devices are compatible with various extraction methodology, methodologies, sorry, such as solutions from Omega Biotech that Karen will discuss later in the webinar, as well as high throughput processing. They have been included in several emergency use authorizations by the FDA were used as a tool in SARS-CoV-2 testing efforts and have been proven to inactivate greater than 99% of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. I will now turn things over to my colleague Tara, who will discuss in more detail saliva as a sample type and a solution for COVID-19 testing. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction to our DNA Genotech products. I am going to expand and share data that we have to support our products for using COVID-19 testing efforts. As Laura mentioned, we have proven that SARS-CoV-2 is inactivated in our saliva collection devices. I will share some data that we have to support these claims. 
In this particular study, saliva samples were spiked with infective SARS-CoV-2. This was done in parallel to a positive control where PBS was spiked with SARS-CoV-2 and corresponding negative unspiked controls. The samples were then mixed with one of our stabilization chemistries, such as omnigene oral or oroclect RNA, and samples were tested on an endpoint dilution assay to measure the viral titer. As you can see in the graph on the right, the black bar representing the positive control has a high level of cytotoxicity, whereas the samples stabilized by DNA genotech chemistries showed no difference with unspiked controls and were non-infective. The overall findings of this study indicate that our products have greater than 99% inactivation of SARS-CoV-2, and importantly, this is achieved using consumer-safe formulations without the use of guanidinium-based chemistries, which further supports our use of these products for at-home collections. Over the past several months, saliva has emerged as a vi viable sample type for SARS-CoV-2 testing, with several studies now published supporting saliva as an alternative sample type to nasal pharyngeal swabs to support the expansion of SARS-CoV-2 testing. As Laura mentioned, our saliva collection and stabilization devices, Omnigene Oral and Oroclect RNA, are well positioned to support COVID-19 testing efforts. We have an initial heat step at 50 degrees Celsius that improves sample homogenization and reproducibility, and have further shown that the device is robust enough to withstand increased temperatures up to 56 degrees Celsius to facilitate decontamination of the exterior of the device, which can be beneficial during, our pan during the pandemic in order to protect laboratory staff. We have data to support viral RNA stability, where the saliva samples were spiked with various RNA viruses, a representative data set shown here on the right. Nucleic acids were extracted at baseline and at various time points following room temperature storage or after simulated transport conditions ranging from minus 20 degrees Celsius to 50 degrees Celsius. Samples were processed using internal RT-qPCR assays that contained primers or probes specific for the viral RNA of interest in the particular study to assess overall performance of viral RNA stability in these products. Our data supports the stability of viral RNA to enable detection of the virus across these conditions, both at room temperature and during transport, expected transport conditions. This data also supports the robust nature of our collection devices and their ability to stabilize viral RNA. In addition, several emergency use authorizations have been granted by the FDA using DNA genotech devices in their diagnostic workflow. For example, P23 Labs was granted an EUA for their TACPATH SARS-CoV-2 assay that is RT-qPCR based. They validated their assay for use with a variety of specimen types, including oral and nasal pharyngeal swabs, as well as saliva collected and stabilized in the Omnigene oral devices. During their validation, they confirmed a limit of detection of 10 copies per microliter for their assay with both nasal pharyngeal swabs and OM505 collected saliva samples, indicating that the assay had comparable sensitivities for both sample types. Importantly, their clinical evaluation of OM505 stabilized sal saliva samples showed 100% agreement for all positive and negative test results when paired with nasal pharyngeal swab results. They also validated that OM505 saliva samples stabilized SARS-CoV-2 viral RNA for five days at room temperature and can be exposed to summer and winter shipping conditions, while allowing for downstream detection of SARS-CoV-2 using their assay further supporting the suitability of this device for at-home collections. In summary, the information and data that Laura and I have presented today further highlight the unique positioning that our molecular products and our expertise in sample collection and stabilization have in supporting COVID-19 testing efforts. We are and will continue to support previous and new customers in their COVID-19 related needs. Further, we show that our stabilization chemistries inactivate greater than 99% of SARS-CoV-2, enabling consumer-safe collections both at home and in healthcare clinic settings. Omnigene oral and oracollect RNA saliva-based collection devices stabilize viral RNA, providing a suitable sample to be paired with extraction methods and downstream RTQ-PCR assays of choice. Next, we will move into the second part of our webinar, where Omega Biotech will describe their unique extraction methodology and data generated through a collaboration with us to assess performance of their extraction kit with Omnigene oral and oracollect RNA saliva collection and stabilization devices. 
Thank you, Tara. Hello, everybody. My name is Kiran Durasula, and I'm the product manager at Omega Biotech. Omega Biotech is based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and our expertise is in providing innovative DNA and RNA purification solutions. We are ISO 9001 2015 certified, and we post a portfolio of more than 400 products with over 52 distributor partners worldwide. Earlier, Tara has explained the advantages of using saliva for COVID-19 detection. To fully realize the potential of saliva, we need rapid and accurate extraction methodologies that provide high sensitivity of detection. My talk is gonna address that and provide Omega Biotech solution for extraction of viral RNA from saliva collected in DNA genotech devices. At the heart of the Omega solution is our magnetic bead-based kit, MadBind Viral RNA Express Kit. This is designed for high throughput isolation of viral RNA from nasopharyngeal swabs saliva, and other matrices basically targeting COVID-19 screening. The lysis buffer TNA that's included in this kit completely inactivates the SARS-CoV-2 virus, ensuring the safety of healthcare workers as well as lab personnel. This kit being magnetic bead-based, it can be fully automated on various open-ended liquid handling platforms as well as magnetic processors. In fact, we have automated protocols available for platforms such as Hamilton, TCAN, Kingfisher, etc. To support the high throughput capability of this kit, we provide this kit in a supersized format. Basically, it has reagents capable of performing 2,304 extractions. This kit has already featured in four EUAs issued by FDA. Uh, overall, Omega Biotech has Omega Biotech kits have featured, featured in 15 EUAs. The main goal of the study is to provide a comprehensive workflow solution, starting from saliva collected in DNA genotech devices to extraction of viral RNA using Omega Biotech's chemistry. As a proof of concept study, we conducted studies using human coronavirus 229E spiked into the saliva collected in DNA genetics devices and used Omega Biotech's chemistry to determine the sensitivity of detection. To combat a global pandemic like COVID-19, we need accurate technologies that promise quick turnaround time. In that context, I'm gonna talk about Omega Biotech's capability and versatility on various automation platforms and how it answers the need of the hour in terms of speed and high throughput. Coming to the spike in studies, uh, we chose human coronavirus 229E strain because it's an RNA-based virus like SARS-CoV-2. Uh, it belongs to a general family of coronaviruses and it serves as a good representative for these sort of proof of concept studies. So we source the coronavirus 229E strain from Zeptometrics, and the yellow box here outlines how we estimated the viral copy number from the TCID50 value. Briefly, as a working estimate, one can assume the ratio between the TCID50 and PFU to be one is to 0 0.7. And based on the references we found, we assume that there were a total of 1,000 viral copies for each plaque forming unit. Let me walk you through the sample collection and spike in studies protocol. These experiments were done in parallel for OM505 and OR100 devices. First, we collected the saliva in the OM505 and OR100 separately. The saliva was then pooled and screened for the presence of the coronavirus 229E template. Coronavirus 229E is a common cold virus so we wanted to make sure the saliva we collected didn't have this template and it would no way skew the end results. So into this negative screened saliva matrix, we spiked in human coronavirus 229E at 10 full serial dilutions basically from 500 copies per microliter to 0.5 copies per microliter in an input sample of 200 microliters. So once homogeneously mixed, we transferred the spiked in saliva into each well of the 96 well deep well plate for extraction. Here, I would like to mention that 
that these baseline conditions that was tested, the one hour incubation in the DNA genotype device did not impact the viral RNA recovery. And we actually skipped the one hour incubation for our subsequent spike in studies. These results I'm going to like briefly touch upon when I hit the results section later on. Coming to the extraction protocol, it follows a very simple lyse bind wash elevate routine. The samples were first lysed in the lysis buffer. Since saliva contains host genetic material, we skip the addition of carrier RNA, and this definitely helps the end customer save on that reagent. So once the sample was lysed, the viral RNA was bound to the magnetic particles in the presence of isopropanol. The viral bound magnetic particles were then washed once in a high salt buffer, followed by two 80% ethanol washes, followed by elution in 100 microliter nucleus free water. Here, the bind wash elute steps were totally automated on Thermo Fisher Scientific's Kingfisher Flex platform. Post elution, we followed the current gold standard for SARS CoV 2 detection, that is, quantitative reverse transcriptase based PCR methodology for detection of human coronavirus 229E in the L08. As promised earlier, here are my results from the one hour incubation study that we carried out in both OM505 and OR100 devices. Briefly, the saliva collected in these devices was spiked with coronavirus 229E and was subjected to either one hour incubation at 56 degrees C or no incubation prior to extraction. As you can see here, uh, the average CT values are comparable for both one hour incubation as well as um, no incubation for both. And also we tested it at two different templates, two microliter template amount as well as four microliter template amount. And for the, both the template amounts that were tested, the average CT values were comparable but with and without incubation. So this kind of shows that the one hour incubation at this baseline condition did not impact the viral RNA recovery. And also, as I mentioned, we performed the RTQPCR analysis at two template amounts, two and four microliter. And if you look at the delta CT value, it's close to theoretical one. It kind of implies that there is no downstream inhibition in the RTQPCR analysis. Coming to the spike in study results, this slide shows the average CT values that we obtained after spiking in 500 to 0.5 copies per microliter of the coronavirus 229E in the pool saliva collected in OM505. The results suggest, suggest that there's efficient viral RNA recovery at all spike in dilutions. Uh, as you can see that there's positive amplification at all those dilutions. And it also shows that the extraction chemistry was able to detect the virus at concentrations as low as 0.5 copies per microliter. Similar results were obtained from the OR100 spike in studies as well. As you can see, there's positive amplification at all the spike in dilutions that were tested, that is from 500 copies per microliter to 0.5 copies per microliter. And these results also corroborate, uh, you know, the efficiency of detection to be as low as 0.5 copies per microliter with the coronavirus 229E spike in. So to put these results in perspective with what is out there in terms of the EUAs that were issued by FDA using saliva as the collection matrix, um, this slide basically outlines that. Uh, as you can see, the LODs range from 0.4 copies per microliter for Rutgers to 10 copies per microliter for P23 labs. Um, so all the EUAs and the current study actually uses different spike in sources and uses different RTQPCR reagents. So we cannot make a direct comparison, uh, but what we can definitely say is the omega chemistry with the 0.5 copies per microliter um, is very competitive. And it 
serves as a good demonstration of potential success with other viruses, viruses as well, with equally high sensitivity of detection. Also, I would like to make a note that none of the EUAs mentioned here use the Omega Extraction Kit. As I've said before, the need of the hour is speed and throughput so that we can provide quick test results to effectively curb the spread of the disease. So the MacBind Viral RNA Express Kit is magnetic bead based and it can be fully automated on a lot of open-ended open liquid handling platforms as well as magnetic processors. We actually have ready to load scripts and application personnel available to get the end customer up and running as quickly as possible. We also provide troubleshooting help and method refinement when and where possible. Coming to the timings that one can, one can obtain with Omega Chemistry, on Kingfisher platform, we can process 96 samples in 40 minutes. On platforms such as Hamilton Microlab Star, four 96 well plates, that is a total of 384 samples can be processed in one hour, 45 minutes. And on TCAN Fluent NAP, uh, the same 384 samples can be processed in one hour, 15 minutes. The timings mentioned here do not include the sample transfer step. And uh, compared to the other timings out there in the market, the timings that we obtain with Omega Chemistry are highly competitive and one, are, and one of the best on the market. Our chemistry is very versatile and it can be easily adapted to other platforms such as Beckman Coulters, Biomech, OpenTrans OT2, as well as Perkin Elmer's Janus. Overall, the study reinforces the use of saliva as a diagnostic candidate for COVID-19, paving way for at-home self-collection kits. The study here outlines a comprehensive workflow solution right from saliva collection DNA genetic devices to extraction of viral RNA using Omega Biotech's chemistry to subsequent detection of virus using RT-PCR reagents of choice. The Omega Biotech MagBind viral RNA express kit definitely answers the need of speed and throughput with its high throughput capability and has potential to maximize the testing capacity without compromising the sensitivity of detection. With that, I thank you all for your attention and hand it over to Laura for concluding remarks. That's great. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Tara. Um, so just a quick housekeeping note, and I saw a question come in um, to let you know that a copy of the recording of this webinar, uh, along with the white paper of the results that Karen just finished presenting, will be available uh, and sent around following this webinar. Uh, but if you want to reach out and connect with us before then, um, feel free to do so. Contact information is uh, um, displayed on the screen there. So now we'll be moving on to the question and answer portion uh, of the webinar, and we've had quite a few, um, so we'll get through as many as we can. Um, so the first question, uh, so this listener is very interested in learning more about how the saliva collection and stabilization devices can support back to school efforts uh, amid the pandemic. Tara, do you maybe want to start us off here? Sure, that's a great question and something that we have been involved in with customers who are setting up COVID-19 testing programs to allow for both safe return to workplaces as well as schools. Our Omnigene Oral and OraCollect RNA devices are well positioned to support these types of programs due to the ease of use for collection, um, where samples can be collected at home or on site without the assistance from a healthcare professional. In addition, the ability of these devices to stabilize viral RNA during room temperature storage and expected transport conditions ensure that a reliable saliva sample is delivered to the testing lab for downstream processing. Yeah, to add to that, uh, I want to talk from the extraction point of view. Um, pool testing is actually a great idea um, where you can actually pull the sample from like multiple individuals and test as one. This not only, um, you know, supports the back to school effort, but also increases the frequency of testing. So if the test comes back negative, uh, that indicates that uh, the individuals whose samples were pooled 
are uh, all assumed to be uninfected. If the test does come out to be positive, um, you know, then the, then it's retested where uh, each individual in the pool is retested separately and uh, like that they can identify the infected persons. Uh, so this method has potential to reduce the number of tests needed and also at the same time increase the frequency of testing uh, that would be needed to support the back to school efforts. Uh, here I would like to say that um, this approach has been piloted by researchers at Nebraska and uh, they found that they could reduce the number of tests needed by like 69 percent. Awesome. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, so the next question is, uh, given the global um, recent shortages, how robust is Omega Biotech's and DNA Genotech's supply chain to support manufacturing of these products? Uh, Karen, do you want to start? Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> uh, for sure, uh, we at Omega Biotech were uh, able to scale up our manufacturing and production capacity to meet the increasing demand. In fact, uh, we shipped out more than 20 million preps so far. Um, also, none of our none of our viral kits are on back order. Uh, we actually make our own magnetic beads that many people are not aware of. So this is not process limiting and it has definitely helped in, uh, uh, you know, helped us in increasing the production and meet the increasing demand. Okay, that's perfect. And on, on the DNA genome front, genotech geno tech front, I'll just quickly add that it responded properly um, to COVID-19 by expanding production and manufacturing capacity of our various saliva collection devices as well. Okay. Moving on, um, so a viewer has asked how reliable saliva is as a sample type for SARS-CoV-2 diagnostic testing. And so it's a two-part question. The second part is, can you comment on the efficacy of saliva compared to nasopharyngeal swabs? Um, so Tara, do you want to just start us off with, uh, with answering this one? Sure, that's a great question. Um, so over the past several months, saliva has emerged as a viable sample type for SARS-CoV-2 testing with several published studies as well as EUAs that demonstrate saliva-based testing is comparable to testing performed using nasal pharyngeal swabs. Um, as I mentioned in the webinar, as an example, the P23 lab EUA included data showing that their limit of detection for SARS-CoV-2 assay is uh, 10 copies per microliter, both for nasal pharyngeal swabs and saliva stabilized in omnigene oral devices, indicating a similar detection sensitivity for their assay. In addition, in their clinical evaluation, as I had mentioned, they did demonstrate 100% agreement for both positive and negative test results when comparing nasal pharyngeal swabs to the omnigene oral stabilized saliva samples. Yeah, just to uh, echo that, uh, there has been uh, quite a few bridging studies um, that were done comparing the efficacy of um, uh, saliva versus nasopharyngeal swabs, and there have been a lot of EUAs published and a lot of like, um, you know, references in the literature one, one can find. Um, I just want to quote uh, one of those in a recent uh, editor correspondence to New England Journal of Medicine by Yale. Um, a study was performed on 70 patients during the course of their hospitalization, and they found that uh, the sensitivity of detection was comparable for saliva specimens uh, saliva specimens versus nasopharyngeal swabs. So, uh, you know, all this data point to saliva being a worthy candidate for COVID-19 detection. Okay, perfect. Um, so the next question is, um, how, how the workflow discussed in the webinar differs from the tests being used at Yale or the University of Illinois? So yeah, I can answer this question, okay. Laura. Um, the workflows used um, for the COVID-19 testing programs at Yale or the University of Illinois are direct to assays that use unstabilized saliva samples as a direct input to an RTQ-PCR based assay. Um, a few key advantages, I think, of the workflow that Karen and I presented today include the viral inactivation in both the stabilization chemistry as well as the extraction lysis buffer, which ensures safe handling of collected samples. 
And in addition, um, the use of our stabilization and collection devices allow for easy and safe at-home collections, shipping of samples back to a diagnostic lab, and the use of stabilized samples does have some advantages over unstabilized, particularly with the large backlogs at testing facilities that are occurring across the globe. Okay, awesome. Um, the next question, I think for Kieran, um, can you, sorry, can the workflow target other viruses? So from an extraction standpoint, um, Kieran, can you address this? Uh, sure. Um, the omega extraction chemistry is very robust. Uh, it can extract DNA-based viruses as well as RNA-based viruses. Uh, we actually have internal R&D data supporting it, and we do have some customers who are using this for DNA-based viral detection. Um, you know, with the upcoming flu season, uh, we envision that uh, this kit can be used in uh, respiratory, uh, respiratory panel testing where one can target like influenza, RSV, uh, along with SARS-CoV-2. Okay. Um, great. So just looking at some other ones that have just come in here. Um, so question, um, is there any reason why your study was not conducted with a coronavirus that causes a common cold? Sorry, it was conducted um, with a coronavirus that causes a common cold and not SARS-CoV-2. Sure, I can answer that. Uh, uh, to be able to conduct experiments with like live SARS-CoV-2, you need DSL level 3, right? And you need a lot of... Um, um, you know, restrictions with regards to who can process those samples. Um, and also, since we are an extraction company, we want to make sure that we don't bring in SARS-CoV-2 transcripts uh, into the lab facility. So um, the coronavirus 229E belongs to the general family of coronaviruses. Uh, and it's also an RNA-based virus like uh, SARS-CoV-2. So we chose that to be a good representative of SARS-CoV-2 and decided to do experiments with that. Uh, and then the next one, again, for you, Kieran, is how fast is the express kit? Uh, so as I mentioned in the webinar earlier, um, on a Kingfisher platform, one can actually extract 96 samples in like 40 minutes. Uh, on, I've actually mentioned timings with regards to like different platforms like Hamilton Star. You could do like 384 samples in one hour, 45 minutes. Uh, on a platform such as TCAN, uh, Fluent 1080, the same 384 samples can be extracted in just 75 minutes. So, uh, so it, I want to say that it depends on you know the liquid handling platform and um, uh, how many samples the end user is actually extracting. Okay. Uh, next one is going to be for you, Tara. If Oracleq and Omigene have lysis capability, uh, is it possible to use the collected saliva directly for RT-QPCR without further RNA um, extraction steps? Yeah, so um, we've been working um, internally to validate our products with use on different um, workflows. Um, for your specific needs in terms of different assays that you're using, I would um, recommend contacting our tech support team so that we can help you for your specific use case. Okay. And then the next question is, are there collection kits capable of inactivating the virus like Triton X100 that also preserve viral and or cellular protein 3D structure? Yeah, so I, I did mention in one of the um, questions that came through uh, just through a typed answer um, that our chemistries are detergent based for these products. So that is, um, that's how the, the inactivation is occurring. Um, in terms of keeping an intact cellular 3D structure, um, this particular chemistry is, is not doing that. Okay, um, the next one is have encountered some viscosity problems with automated liquid handling um, saliva as a sample. Uh, have you encountered something similar or is your formulation designed to address this? 
Yeah, so I think that's a good point. And um, as I mentioned in my portion of the talk, our upfront um, heating step at 50 degrees or also increasing that to 56 degrees to allow for um, inactivation um, for safe handling. That really, that step is really key for enabling homogenization of the sample and reproducibility to help avoid some of those issues that people are encountering. Yeah, uh, I just want to like add to that. Um, we can also like uh, introduce steps during the extraction process by treating the saliva sample with DTT to liquefy it so that it can be uh, handled on a liquid handler, you know, reduce the viscosity of the sample and um, it can be processed on a liquid handler more efficiently. Okay, um, Kieran, for you, do you have scripts available for the automated platforms? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, so the, we actually do provide ready to load scripts for platforms such as Hamilton, platforms from Hamilton, from TCAN, and magnetic processors like Kingfisher, Magmax, and Biosprint. For other platforms, we can uh, guide the customer um, in scripting and as well as give general instructions on how to script on those platforms, but we do not have scripts, uh, scripts available for other platforms than what I just mentioned. Okay, um, another question. Um, Tara, are there any possible drug interactions with your chemistry such that patients may have to rinse out their mouth prior to collecting saliva? Yeah, so we've done extensive interference studies on our devices and we, as part of our instructions for use, include an initial warning at the first step that you need to wait um, 30 minutes minimum from the last time that you drank or ate um, prior to collection to avoid the inhibition inhibitors that could be present in, in the collected sample. Okay. Um, and then another one, if co-infected with the flu virus, would this be inferent on the assay? Oh, in, yeah, interferent, interference on the assay, sorry. Uh, so since I, I mean, as I mentioned before, um, the extraction chemistry is robust and it can extract all the viruses that are actually present in the sample. Um, so it can actually be used in like multiplex PCR or in respiratory panel testing. So I do not really think that there would be like interference from one virus on other virus detection, if that makes sense. Yeah, and on the DNA genotech side, I would just like to add um, that we, as I mentioned, um, have validated our devices for a variety of different RNA and DNA viruses, but we also have some internal ongoing studies to expand this work to specifically test for the stability of respiratory viruses to support customers interested in using our devices for broader surveillance and testing efforts, which are relevant to the upcoming influenza season. Okay. Um... Could the Omnigene oral be useful in a point of care setting without an extraction step? Sorry, Laura, can you repeat that question? Oh. Sorry, I clicked it and then it was gone. But it essentially is, can Omnigene oral be used in a point of care setting um, without an extraction step? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so that, that comes back to, I think, the question that was asked earlier about how our workflow differs from those direct to workflows um, that are occurring at Yale or the University of Illinois. So we have not directly tested our um, saliva devices with those direct to assays. Um, and the, that um, validation work would need to, be re need to be performed up front before including our devices with those types of assays. And then what is the low detection limit for SARS-CoV-2 RNA from saliva samples? So I think as Kieran showed, and I also mentioned in my um, part of the webinar, that it depends on the assay, what the detection limit is for the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, so as Kieran gave a really nice overview of the different limit of detections um, there's for saliva and nasal pharyngeal swabs, it really is assay dependent. 
But I think the key takeaway is that in those assays that are comparing saliva to nasal pharyngeal swabs, that there's a lot of studies showing similar sensitivities for both sample types. Okay. And then is 50 to, uh, 56 degrees C enough for an activation? Yeah, so we actually um, have recommended increasing this uh, to 56 degrees. Um, our devices are robust enough to withstand that increased temperature and it just allows for um, inactivation of, of the virus. Okay. Um, so switching here, we have um, a question asking what the most efficient method for detection of the SARS-CoV-2 virus would be um, and why. Um, Kieran, do you want to maybe start this question off? Yeah, sure, I can, I can talk about that. Um, so the current gold standard for SARS-CoV-2 detection is RT-QPCR. Uh, there are other tests uh, that are being performed that are based on antigen testing and antibody testing. Um, so the antibody testing, for example, uh, it cannot detect active coronavirus infection. It's based on the antibodies the body generates in response to the virus. So it's not detecting the virus itself. Uh, so it can actually take several weeks uh, for the body to produce detectable quantities of antibodies. Um, so this kind of testing is not appropriate for active coronavirus infection. It could be used for like, you know, broader surveillance testing and to check for, uh, you know, person's immunity against uh, COVID-19. Uh, coming to the antigen testing, uh, this test can actually detect active coronavirus, but it has been, uh, uh, but it does have like lower sensitivity of detection compared to like molecular based testing and which could lead to like you no know, more false negatives, especially when the viral load is low uh, during the beginning of the infection. Uh, so coming to the molecular based testings, um, in my opinion, are more rob robust and uh, they can actually detect COVID, uh, detect SARS-CoV-2 from a variety of uh, sample types. And um, again, no test is 100% accurate all the time. So uh, to just meet the demand of uh, testing, combination of tests may be needed. And it also depends on a specific use case. Yeah, and I would just like to add to what Karen has said. So there are um, a lot of common methods used for analyzing um, samples in the context of SARS-CoV-2 testing. So like she mentioned, RTQPCR is often the gold standard. Um, there's also a lot of next generation sequencing that is being used in this field. So the choice really depends on the overall objective of the testing, the budget constraints, equipment availability. Um, RTQPCR is a fast and relatively affordable way to screen samples for the presence or absence of SARS-CoV-2. So when quick population screening is required um, for a simple yes or no answer, RTQPCR often makes sense. Um, in addition, there are several multiplex RTQPCR solutions that offer rapid detection of several respiratory viral pathogens um, simultaneously from a single sample. So this approach greatly reduces the reagents required for sample processing. And it also provides an efficient means for surveillance of other common respiratory viruses, such as influenza and RSV in parallel to SARS-CoV-2. Whereas NGS, on the other hand, can also be used for sensitive detection of SARS-CoV-2, and it could also provide a more in-depth look into the viral sequences within the sample, allowing for genomic epidemiology tra tracking um, if samples are analyzed on a wider scale. This could also provide important information about vi virus transmission and whether new infections are being introduced from other regions and in turn give indications to the success of control measures that are being implemented to reduce local transmission. Great, thanks. So there's been a few similar questions, so I'm just going to kind of pull them and it's just about like how to get products, so both need genome tech products and mega biotech products, um, you know, outside of the US and, and Canada. Um, so I'll just go quickly first on the DNA Genotech side. So we do sell direct whenever we can, but in certain countries we can't sell direct to, we do have distribution partners um, set up. So if you're in a country and you're unsure, I just recommend that you reach out with us, reach out to us and um, you'll get connected with your account manager and then they can either, depending on what country, and they can either um, sell directly to you or connect you with uh, our distribution partner. 
Um, so Karen, do you want to maybe address that question um, from the Omega Biotech side as well? Sure. So outside of North America, um, we do have like more than 50 uh, worldwide distribution partners uh, and the list is actually available on our website. Uh, also, you can reach to us at info at omegabiotech.com and we can definitely guide you uh, on the distributor in your particular country and uh, connect you with them. Okay, that's great. I'm just kind of scrolling through. Um, I feel like we kind of addressed this already, but because it came through again, um, what is the sensitivity of your product um, and or your performance data? Sure. So, so that, um, as I mentioned earlier, really depends on the assay being used. So I think it's important to note here that, so from the DNA Genotech standpoint, we're providing a collection device to allow for reliable collection and stabilization of the saliva. And on the Omega Biotech side, they're offering uh, a robust extraction methodology to process those samples to be included together in a, a diagnostic workflow. So every assay has a different sensitivity or limit of detection, and those independent workflows need to be validated for the, the components that are included. Awesome. Okay, well, thank you um, both Kieran and Tara. Um, we're, we're pretty much at time here. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for joining um, and we will be following up in the next day or two um, with that white paper and with the recording. And again, if you have any questions um, that pop up, please feel free to reach out uh, and we'll be happy to address them. So thanks again. Take care. Thank you.